Hi, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of Chick Chats. I'm now able to say it more easily. Today, I am so excited to have my darling friend, Jenny Boyd, here, um, who, by the way, is recovering. She is in recovery from an accident. So I'm so grateful that you were able to make it. Hi. Hi, Chris, and thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and to, I know, to chat with you, too. Yeah, it's good. We saw each other at the Beetle Fest after not seeing each other for quite a while. So that was a that was so wonderful. I can't believe it. The first question I have to ask you for those who don't know is that you are Jennifer Juniper, which you know that that gets used quite a lot. Does that do you get tired of it? No. Never. Oh, okay. That's so I know. And yeah. when I hear it, you know, throughout the years either in an elevator or in a market or whatever. And I hear, you know, mothers who call their kids Juniper. I think it's great because I love the song and what it does, it reminds me of a very innocent time. And so there's nothing but loveliness all around it. So um, I, I think probably everybody knows, but Donovan wrote the song while you were in India. Is that right? No, that's not uh -huh. right. It was um, while I was working at the Apple Boutique, waiting to go to India, because I think we went to India probably in the February, and um, and I started working at the, the boutique uh, just towards the end of the year. And then one day Donovan came down the steps. I was downstairs, and I, I'd met him before at Patty and George's. And he said, oh, I didn't know you worked here. And so he wanted to hear all about my trip, because I was in San Francisco for six months, he wanted to hear all about meditation and what's it like. And so we went into one of these little dressing rooms and chatted and chatted and what my spiritual feelings and what was this and what was that. And then a few days later, he asked if um, if I would like to come to his manager's house because we were going to have Sunday lunch there or something. And he said, and I've got a, I've got a song to sing you. He went into this room and uh, sat on the bed and he was like by the pillows, you know, and started playing and I was right at the other end listening to this song and I was pretty shy in those days so I wasn't quite sure where to look because I realized um do you love her yes I do sir you know it was very um obviously a sort of declaration of love or he had a major crush or something you know just uh but it's always got a sweet sweet feeling about it what does that feel like what did that feel like to you when you heard him singing it and you're sitting right there and he's declaring his love for you I felt quite shy and then I knew I had time to look away because then he starts singing it in French <laughs> and so <laughs> and I couldn't understand that it was more just this feeling of oh gosh um this is a song and it's about me and uh it was it was just just very dear very sweet that is so sweet and I asked that because I had that experience with Leon when I heard Pisces Apple Lady which it's quite well I suppose it's all about it's their feelings coming out that's it and that's their creative streak isn't it you know that's how they actually release the, whatever the creative form they take to say what they're feeling which in fact you bring us to the fact that you've written a you wrote a book about it quite a long time ago when it was part of if I'm correct it was your thesis for your doctorate degree yes that was um that was a long time ago so i interviewed all these musicians between uh 2000 uh, 1988 to 1990 obviously because george being my brother was brother-in-law and eric as well it was easy to get them ian wallace who was my second husband was playing with people like don henley bonnie Raitt, crosby stills and nash and so i had a great selection of musicians that i could um interview I'd never interviewed them before. I'd always been part of the crowd, not having one-on-ones with them. So Don Henley was my first one. Once I stopped worrying about was the tape recorder recording, um, it was great. And we got into some really good stuff. I'd written out my questions beforehand. And then from there on, I sort of went to the blues guys like B.B. King, Willie Dixon, and Ravi Shankar happened to be in town. And it was quite magical because anyone I would think of Peter Gabriel, suddenly someone would say, oh, I know, Peter's th this and this and this. Or, you know, it's like it just was, I was in the zone 
talking about when they're in the zone. It came out in America and in Japan originally. It was um, published by Simon & Schuster in 1992. And then when I moved back to England, it actually, you know, the same same stuff really uh, came out in England, different cover, different name. And then um, it quite recently, Bonnier Publishing wanted me to redo it. And because I had um, eight of the audio cassettes left, I transcribed those completely. And uh, whereas in the book, they only were snippets of quotes depending on what the chapter was about. If it was the collective unconscious or if it was the drugs and alcohol, you'd say, oh, Keith Richards says this or this, and then so-and-so says this and this. But this time, Keith Richards has his own little Keith Richards, and I've put all the bits together that were from the original book. After about 20, 25 years, I destroyed the audio cassettes. Hate to say it, but I'd been carrying them around with me America, England, all over England, and I was always very nervous if somebody should steal them or lose or something would happen to them when they had trusted me with the interviews. And so I was very, very um, conscientious about it. And then finally, I thought, you know, because they take up a lot of room, they were audio cassettes, it wasn't like it was on MP3. Uh -huh. And, um, and I couldn't ask anybody when the time got closer, when we did have MP3, I couldn't say, Oh, can you transcribe these to digital, because I wasn't sure if they were going to actually, you know, they could easily have just kept kept them. But then in the end, I thought, Okay, I'm just not gonna have to worry about it anymore. And I'll keep eight. And I didn't know what, why I even chose the eight I did, but it was Joni Mitchell, George Harrison, Eric Clapton, Ringo, um, Don Henley, Graham Nash, Ravi Shankar, and um, jazz drummer, Tony Williams. I kept those. So for this new book, and I was given carte blanche, I could do whatever I want. I transcribed those. Even after, I don't know, 35 years listening to them, it inspired me so much. What they say, what they were talking about is so um, ageless. And so I did that and had, you know, pretty much most of the others from the um, Musicians in Tune, the original book, but in a different format, as I'd said. But I also wanted to get some uh, more current musicians to show the difference of the music world compared with then and now. So I got Jacob Collier, who's, what's he, about 28, 29, young, great musician, genius, they call him. And then Atticus Ross, who, of course, you know, is winning, has won lots of Grammys and things for his music he's done too for films. Uh, um, a really prolific writer, Egg White, his name is. And, um, you know, he's done uh, songs for Adele and those sort of people. And then another woman who was actually my... I was uh, doing music lessons with her, with our group, called Sarah. Her stage name was Sarah Washington in the 90s. It was pop and dancing, and she got lots of records, you know, hit records. And then she's a three-time cancer survivor and doing very different things with the music that she writes and sings and everything now. And it just shows, you know, the healing power of music, too. Is the book out yet in in the States? Yeah, the book's out in England and in the States now. Um, it's called Icons of Rock in Their Own Words. Oh, I love uh, it. And, and it's published by, by Bonnier. In the States, it's published by Mango, Mango Books. So is it available on Amazon? Do you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. good. I can yeah. get it since I didn't get one when I saw you. <laughs> you have been such a pivotal, really, person in the whole rock and roll world that our generation has grown up with and loved and that a lot of young people love now. And and people don't realize how pivotal you have been. First of all, you were with Mick Fleetwood when he was still, when it was the old the old Fleetwood Mac, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Someone asked me the other day, do you think that Mick had ever gone to Friar Park? And I said, I saw him at Friar Park. I think that's yeah. where I met you when you and exactly. Mick were at Friar Park. When Mick and I first knew each other, he was in a little band in Notting Hill Gate called The Shanes. And it wasn't until some time later that Peter Green, because I remember Peter when, you know, we were both all young, uh, Peter Green decided let's let's um, set up this band because they'd been playing together with John Mayle in, in the Flamingo Club and, you know, they'd known each other so kind of on the same kind of circuit. And that's how Fleetwood Mac got together. It was through Peter. And it was very different then. 
It was blues. Very different band. It was a blues band. I remember yeah. that. And yeah. you were with Mick. How old were you when you got to? When we you... met when we were 16, 17, that sort of age. Then you guys, at some point, they decide to move to L.A., right? You were married to him by we that. We were married, absolutely. And we had two children. I just recently had Lucy, the youngest one. She was oh. about one, um, almost coming for two when we left. Mm, yeah maybe when we left for LA Amy my, Amelia my other daughter was um two coming up for three so they were little I was the only one that had kids and we all we all moved to LA no kidding you were the only one who had kids of all of us I think at that time it was kind of like we're all going crazy but you've got yeah. the responsibility it was so amazing yeah. That's right. For those who don't know, although I think that's crazy if you don't know this, you were married twice to Mick. <laughs> yes, because it was tough. You can imagine once we got to L.A. Um, and obviously, you know, when when we all lived together, to get, you know, in Hampshire, um, in this communal house, it was a huge house. And then they'd all go off on the road for months at a time. And I'd be left with my two little children and the boiler would break down or, you know, it was not it was pretty scary. So then. The idea of moving to L.A. was quite exciting. And we had uh, rented a little place in Laurel Canyon. And, you know, suddenly I was like in the world. Then when they met Stevie and Lindsay, everything changed. I remember going to a little rehearsal when they were just sort of not any no audience, just rehearsing together. And you could see they were going to be enormous. You know, the um, their harmonies were so beautiful. The songs that Stevie and Lindsay bought to the show were just brilliant and uh and Chris and Lindsay everybody got on really well so you could see this was like going to be a good match and uh, by that time we moved to Mick and I and the kids moved to Topanga because he wanted to be outside of LA they were working on this album their first album and Warner Brothers gave them a deadline they had to finish it by and that's when all the cocaine was sort of dripping off the walls. You know, it was just, and Mick wouldn't come home at night or he'd come at four in the morning or stuff. And so our whole world, our whole life changed. And in many ways, it was lovely and amazing because we'd go down to the studio sometimes and listen to what was going on. Um, other times it was, you know, really hard. As I said, being the only one with kids, because you can't go and be hanging out and stuff like that, which was fine. But you also want them to have their dad. So there were those kind of complex issues that made it tricky sometimes, but just fabulous in others. I was seeing our little family falling apart, basically. Now, Mick and I, you know, then he wanted to get a divorce or we got divorced because it was not working. But we still saw each other. We still hung out. And so it didn't make any difference. It was like, what do you mean? You know, so what? We got divorced. The band needed to go to England. And for us all to be able to go as a family, we had to have green cards. And the way we could get green cards is if we were married. So then we remarried. For the U.S., right? Green cards mm -hmm. for the U.S., right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it wasn't romantic. It was in the lawyer's office, you know. Oh, I never Lindsay knew. was our best man. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but it was tough because Mick was finally getting the recognition he'd always wanted. And so there's part of me that's very proud of that. And this is such a great band and all that. But then there's the maternal bit like we have kids here, you know. So it was tricky. And then in the end, um, I left L.A. and uh, and moved back to England with them for five years. Um, and they went to a normal school and nobody knew of Fleetwood Mac. And we just ran the corner from Patty and Eric. So we kind of carried on in similar vein in many ways, you know, but it was like Eric and all his band kind of thing. And the kids would come to that. I remember those days very well. I remember coming to your house yes. during that period of time. Yeah. And the girls were just living, they were in their little school uniforms. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. What were you doing during that time personally? Were you just being a mom or were you? I was just being a mom. Yeah. Not that um, nice, I couldn't but... really do anything other than that because, you know, it's that same thing with a lot of mothers, I think, where you have to take them to school and you're part of the school run and then you pick them up. Um, one day, one of them might not feel very well or so you're sort of um, doing your mum thing. And then during while they're at school, Patty and I would sometimes meet up in Cranley and sort of have lunch together or 
uh, or sometimes I'd go to London and see a friend. I wasn't working. And I think in a way, if I was ever going to turn change anything, I would have changed that to finding something that was to, uh, some kind of job. But I mean, no one I knew was working. So it was different, you know, it's the rock and roll world. But anyway, it was um, it was a different kind of time and it was very gentle, a lot of a lot of that. And Mick would come and visit us and we'd talk about getting back together again, you know, as we always did and do, and not now. But, um, you know, it was, uh, it never really felt it was a clean cut, that's it. He was drinking heavily and doing using and stuff. So often the kids wouldn't hear from him for ages. So it was as it's that thing where you try and be mum and dad um, for for them. But it was you know that, that was the five years, and then I met up with went to Christmas uh, Christmas V's for Christmas one year, and met up with Ian Wallace, and we got on really well. And of course, he knew Mick, and Mick knew him, and so it seemed like an obvious thing. So when he came to England, he was in uh, David Lindley's band El Ray X. Then I moved. To LA after vowing I would never marry another musician and I would never move back to LA and it was a drummer (laughs) another drummer (laughs) and then Paula your younger sister who sadly isn't with us although she was such a I mean you guys were the trio sisters of mine and Paula she married the producers (laughs) that's right that's right we were all just rock and roll chicks you know we yeah. knew and I often think because the way we were brought up you know in Africa was we were feral you know we didn't have anybody looking after us really we just you know we were just like um do whatever we wanted to do uh in a way it's very like we so we fitted into the rock and roll world really easily because yes. we like kids who wouldn't grow up you know <laughs> well, and some of us still are. <laughs> so I, I, you were with Ian for, and you married Ian. And married Ian. after or during that period of time, you made a career choice. Yes. What happened when we were in Hawaii uh, for our honeymoon, I had a near drowning experience there mm. because um, a couple of the musicians who had come along uh, had um, Ian had asked them, gave us magic mushrooms, but synthetic. And I hadn't had anything like that since, you know, mid 60s. And then everybody went out to swim. And I believed I could swim underwater with no mask on and um, breathe, just breathe. I'm not a strong swimmer and I'm always a bit scared of being in the ocean. The others were like way out. And I panicked because then big waves were coming and it felt really touch and go. And so I tried to swim back to the shore, just hoping I wouldn't think that I could really breathe underwater without a mask. And it was then I realized uh, it was time I gave back to the world. You know, it's just I, I lived this kind of rock and roll life and blah, blah, blah. And that was my turning point. From there, I, was, um, I, I trained for a while, trained, did a training to talk to kids in state schools about um, drugs and alcohol. Um, I, was, I couldn't talk myself. I was a bit too sort of shy. I wasn't used to that. But we'd go in pairs and I would talk to the little kids afterwards. And then I decided to go to college and um, I was interested in holistic health. I got a BA. And then I got a master's in counselling psychology and I just kept going. And then I got my, um, did a PhD, and that eventually, the dissertation, then became Musicians in Tune, because oh. my dissertation was called The Creative and Spiritual Link. You see, that's so amazing about you, is that through all of that rock and roll stuff, you ended up becoming a therapist. Mm. So did I, but... <laughs> so did you, exactly, exactly. And drug and alcohol counselor, that was my big thing. And that brought us to our connection that we both worked for Cottonwood de Tucson, which is a treatment center in Tucson. And you came, I introduced you to them, and then you actually ran the London office of Cottonwood. That's right. All the clients. I mean, it was wonderful. At one yeah. time, this place in the desert had all these British lords and <laughs> and all kinds. It was such yeah. an interesting thing. Yeah. And what was so amazing working for them is that I would bring them, like, you know, Fran, the psychiatrist over to England to meet our psychiatrist because I knew we were sort of 
light years behind what was going on in the States, especially in Arizona. And so, and then we brought Russ Warner to come over, do family program in England. So I organized these uh, groups of uh, meetings and stuff. So there was a mixture and bring people out, the psychiatrists say from um, the treatment centers in England, bring them over to Tucson, uh, to Cottonwood. So it was a mix and match and teaching, I think, a lot of the stuff that goes on at Cottonwood letting people know from the treatment centers here they were they were way behind it was actually a very creative process doing all of that during that yes. time which by the way was like the 2000 oh i left there in 2000 uh, 11 eight, 2008 i think yeah so it was in the early part of the 2000s like i think yeah. it was yeah. a creative process that we actually set up with all yeah. of that yeah that's right that's right and then uh what was so amazing when i'd go and visit you know and they'd have all the people that had been to cottonwood and uh done really well and they'd be sort of like dancing and i don't know it would bring tears to my eyes because i'd um i'd do the assessments of them first and they were just like oh terrible and then i'd do the aftercare group in in, in england um once a week and you'd see these people that were sort of on death's door and they'd got higher power and they were had just another chance of their life and they were aware of that so it was very rewarding in a lot of ways it was a very rewarding time for me mm. also you know working mm. with all of the I particularly loved working with the young people yeah the, the young adults that would come into Cottonwood and the one thing is that they always took away their phone and their music because back then it was iPod iPods and I sort of like went, isn't that like how they know what they're feeling? And yeah. so I started a group there with music. So we had a music group and they nobody understood it. People really didn't get how important that was. Yeah. You know, yeah. The music part of it. And, and then the other thing was I had what was spring workshops, which uh, I'd get different therapists, psychotherapists from America. Same thing and do organize groups so they could do workshops like Raquel Lerner, you know, just on trauma or um, Don Lavender. Remember he used to come over or, you know, learning to let go. And, and those went on for years, uh, three times, three times a year. Oh, even after you weren't working with Cottonwood. Oh yeah. 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 Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. The recovery keeps going. What are you doing now? Sitting here talking to you. <laughs> doing well this. actually I'm, I'm because I've had my accident and broken my elbow there's not an awful lot I can do but of course me being me already organizing what other people I'd like to interview for when this book either when this book becomes a paperback or who knows what so um, I don't have quite the same gusto because I am still repairing right. and only what two and a half weeks ago but um, I don't know. I just I'm, I just love the whole thing to do with creativity. And at the moment, I'm listening to Rick Rubin's um, uh, uh, Aud Audible uh, about it on his book. I've got the book as well. And I'm just loving listening to that, you know. Oh, yeah. You've always been associated with creativity, starting at the Apple store. Well, I don't know. It started way before that, I'm sure. But definitely. Yeah. Well, I want you to know that our friend Simon, who has directed my um, my documentary, thinks you and I are like sisters. Yes, Chris. And we actually are. And we actually are. Actually are. I mean, it's so, so extraordinary, different parts of our life where we meet up, you know. I it's, know. It happens. We've yeah. traveled very, very much the same route. More, yeah. yeah, from different continents a lot of the times. Yeah. I want to thank you and hope that you'll join us again. I'm even thinking on doing some panels of women at some point, um, talking about different things like creativity would be a great subject to go into. Mm -hmm. and aging is another one. And aging, <laughs> yes, yes. One on aging for sure. So mm -hmm. I, darling, I so appreciate you giving me the time to be here. And thank uh, you, Chris. And it's been lovely as always. It's lovely to talk always. to you. And you are one of the loveliest people I know. Oh, thank you. So, thank you. So everyone, please be sure and share and subscribe 
and um and come back and thank you to jenny boyd love you